Well, welcome. Um, my name is Dr. Brian Cote, and I'm the medical director for Urgent Care Holland Hospital. And uh, we'll get started with this uh, discussion here. I hope it will become a discussion. I'm pretty informal when it comes to lectures, so if you have a question, just raise your hand. I'll try to stop and answer it as best I can. Um, we have reserved some time toward the end of the hour uh, for questions and answers, and I'll do my best to answer them then as well. But if you have a burning question, feel free to ask it right as we go along. So we'll get started. Um, I guess by way of introduction, I'll tell you a little bit about myself. Um, I've been with Holland Hospital now for 20 years. And uh, before I went to medical school, I spent 14 years as a paramedic in West Michigan. So that was my pre-hospital experience and introduction into medicine. And then after medicine, I, I, got my, uh, I got board certified in emergency medicine and worked at Holland Hospital's emergency department for about 17 years. And then after that, came over to urgent care, and I've been there for about five years so far. I think it'll be five years in the, this coming month. So that's kind of my background and experience and, and why I love this topic, because I've been in both arenas, and I've seen uh, different circumstances of uh, how people come in, how they make those decisions, sometimes the right decision, sometimes not so, uh, so good a decision. And we'll talk about how we can avoid making some of the mistakes about where you choose to go when you have uh, an unanticipated, uh, unscheduled medical emergency. All right. So choosing wisely, uh, two, two buzzwords that have to do with urgent care these days is time, saving time and saving cost. And that's going to be basically the theme of this discussion here. At uh, Holland Hospital, we have the highest quality of care from a, a top-ranked Michigan hospital. And we're pretty proud of that, according to U.S. health grades. We're in the top uh, 100 best hospitals nationwide, so we're, we're really proud of that. And urgent care really uh, became a, a larger organization within the past five years. We have on-site uh, board-certified physicians. It's coordinated care with your primary care physician. And that's one of the distinguishing features between us and other urgent care, so we'll talk about that as we get into the lecture. We have two convenient locations we'll talk about, what we consider to be a better value at lower cost compared, relatively speaking, to the emergency department. And I probably should stop right here and say I'm, I'm not anti-emergency medicine. I'm very pro-emergency medicine, and I'm very pro-urgent care medicine. And my, my goal, my passion, is to help people make the decision on where they need to go when they have that unanticipated emergency. Um, just a little advertising thing up there. Adjusted charges have transferred to Holland Hospital's emergency department. And we do transfer some of the patients that come to us to the emergency department. We'll talk about how that happens if, if the need arises. So about three and a half years ago, uh, we sat down together and we created a vision. We, we decided that in the face of Obamacare, when we're trying to save costs, we looked at the emergency department costs and the care that you receive there compared to what you get at urgent care and decided we could do a better job of triaging the community on where to go. So we sat together and came up with this vision statement. The vision of Holland Hospital Urgent Care is to meet our community and regional needs for unscheduled acute care treatment for minor illnesses and injuries and to collaborate with the public and the medical community to provide the most effective and appropriate patient care, cost-effective and appropriate patient care. So that was our vision. That's what we started with. And from that vision, we went from an older building where we were established and previously known as prime care. And then urgent care became the newer buzzword. It's a marketing term, really, that you see nationwide. So we switched the name to urgent care. And since we created this visionary statement, we've left that old facility and moved into two brand new facilities. So we really expanded in the past two and a half years. Uh, healthcare costs in crisis, and this has been going on for at least a couple of decades and has come to fruition even with the recent election uh, debates going on. The, the debate is no longer uh, a, a question of what's more expensive and what's less expensive. Emergency uh, department care is much more expensive uh, compared to urgent care for the same similar diagnosis. And we'll talk about specific examples. I have a couple of bar graphs in here I'll show you that will just be <coughs> astounding, I think, to most people. Uh, especially troubling for families. You know, if you're an average family, you get sick, your kids get sick, eventually you need urgent care or the emergency department, and the question is, where do you go? Where do you go during the day? Where do you go during the night? Where do you go during the holiday weekend or any weekend for that matter when your doctor's office is closed? So how to decide 
there are two slides here I want to go through. And when it comes to making the choice about where you go for your health care needs, <clears throat> there, there are some black and white answers, and there are a lot of gray areas. It's not always that certain, and we're used to seeing that type of encounter and dealing with it. But here are some examples um, of how that works. So basically, when you are deciding where to go for an unanticipated medical need, ask yourself the question, why am I going there? Is it a life or limb threatening condition? So on the right hand side of the slide here, you see extreme medical conditions where you fear, fear that you may be permanently impaired or it will be an endangerment to your life, as opposed to just being uncomfortable and inconvenient. So examples of where we'd like to direct people to go is if they have severe chest pain. Now I'm gonna introduce a couple of caveats for a couple of these examples. When we talk about severe chest pain, obviously the emergency department is probably a better place to go, but let's, let's take two sides of the coin. Say you've got a 55-year-old male patient who has a history of high cholesterol and he's got high blood pressure. Maybe he's a diabetic, maybe he's a smoker, and he's had some previous heart history. Now he's developed some discomfort in his chest and he's not certain about where to go. Well, I would argue in that situation, they're primarily concerned about your heart, the safety of your heart. Am I having another heart attack? In that scenario, we would prefer that you go to the emergency department and not urgent care. Because if you show up like that at our facility, uh, we're gonna transfer you right away to the emergency department anyway. And then the question is, how do you get there? Uh, we'll talk about that as well. On the other side of the coin, say you take a 20-year-old healthy female who jogs five miles a day, takes no medications, is in good health, doesn't smoke, and has sort of a jabbing intermittent chest pain, uh, that person is like, less likely to be a severe cardiac illness. And so we will see those kinds of patients at urgent care. So again, there are, there are gray areas here, but I'm pointing out some examples of the extremes. Severe abdominal pain is uh, another example. We do see a lot of abdominal pain complaints at, at urgent care. Most of those people we do not need to transfer to higher care in the emergency department. But if it's what you consider severe, and you've tried taking some pain medication and it's unrelenting and you're worried about, say, appendicitis or your gallbladder, or if you've been injured and you have significant pain, you're probably gonna be better served in the emergency department. Wheezing and shortness of breath. Now we do see asthmatic patients at urgent care, but you know if you're an individual who has well-known chronic lung disease and you're on a bunch of medications for it, inhalers, maybe oxygen, and you've tried all those things and you're not getting better, then chances are you're gonna be better served in the emergency department. If uh, you're, you're having a simple asthma attack, um, you know, we will see you at urgent care and do a lot of things similar to the emergency department. One example of, of how people come to see us, I had, I had an example uh, a couple years ago when someone was at the Target store and I, I was located at, at the urgent care center on Riley. And while she was shopping, she just had a sudden severe asthmatic attack and she didn't think she was gonna make it to the emergency department. She was on the north side of town, so she stopped in at our facility, which was really the appropriate thing to do and we stabilized her enough to get her down to the emergency department. So we will see cases like that as well. But we are prepared to deal with the initial true emergencies up to a certain point. Uh, paralysis, obviously if you're concerned about uh, whether or not you're having a stroke or you've been injured and something seems paralyzed, then the emergency department is the place to be. But we will see people who have numbness and tingling symptoms, or sometimes we'll have, probably the most classic example we'll see is of someone who comes in who feels pretty good. They don't feel sick, but they've noticed all day long when they look in the mirror, their face is a little droopy on one side, but their arms are working fine, their legs are feeling fine, and they've got something called Bell's palsy, which is concerning to see if you've got this and you look in the mirror and it's on you, but it's not a serious or life-threatening condition, it's a temporary condition. So certain things, you know, we'll, we'll see. Uh, intestinal bleeding, that's a no-brainer. If you're bleeding from your bowels uh, and you're passing a lot of blood from your rectum or vomiting blood, that needs to go to the emergency department. High fevers, rash, especially among children. Uh, I will say this, I have to qualify that a little bit. We do see a lot of kids, a lot of well kids who are sick but not dangerously sick who have high fevers and rashes. Most of these are innocuous about 90% of the time. The, the patients that we're seeing, just like the emergency department, uh, it's a simple viral illness, but you feel lousy when your child has a fever and they're fussy and griping and complaining and we're worried about them. So uh, both places will see 
kids with high fever and rashes. And if it's something that we perceive to be more difficult or serious, then we'll transfer that child either to Holland Hospital here, but oftentimes we'll transfer them out to Grand Rapids because the DeVos Children's Hospital is just down the road. Uh, vaginal bleeding with pregnancy. Uh, we don't like to deliver babies at urgent care. Bottom line, uh, if you've got vaginal bleeding and you're pregnant, the best place to be is in the emergency department because they have equipment there that we do not have the capability of assessing that, that type of pregnancy at urgent care. Repeated vomiting. Well, how much do we mean by repeated vomiting? I use a general clinical rule of thumb, and, and we see a lot of kids that come in because they've been vomiting or having diarrhea. And I often ask the question, how many times would you guesstimate today they vomited? And for me, that magic clinical rule is about 8 to 10. If it's 8 to 10, then I start to worry about whether that child can be treated at urgent care. But if it's less than that, oftentimes we can see these kids and treat them fine with anti-nausea medication. Uh, poisoning. Uh, basically, it goes to the emergency room. We don't have the capability of dealing with a lot of the antidotes with poisoning cases. Um, the other thing is that most poisonings that we see in the emergency department here end up being fairly innocuous. We do see serious poisonings as well, some intentional and some non-intentional. But even if you're a stable patient who's been exposed to some poison agent, chances are you're going to have to be observed for anywhere between four to eight hours in the emergency department anyway, even if you're stable. So for that reason, poisonings, they go downtown to the emergency department. Severe head and eye injuries, I think, speak for themselves. Um, you know, when people come in with uh, simple scalp lacerations, we are prepared to deal with those kinds of things. We see a fair amount of concussions related to sports injuries or falls. Um, but usually the biggest concern when it comes to severe head injuries is does the patient have a skull fracture or more importantly, do they have an underlying brain injury? That's what we really care about. And those patients will need a, eventually need a CAT scan, uh, maybe an MRI of those regions of their body, and we don't have that capability at urgent care. Allergic reactions, I'll qualify that. We see a ton of allergic reactions at urgent care, and most of those are innocuous. So we do see certain kinds of allergic reactions. What we're referring to in this uh, slide right here are severe reactions referred to as anaphylaxis where you've been exposed to something, or you've ingested something, or you've taken something, and you look at the face. If your eyelids are swelling, your lips are swelling, your tongue is swelling, and you can't speak, uh, or you're having difficulty breathing, you're going to the emergency department. But a simple rash that's just kind of itchy, you know, uh, we can often take care of those minor complaints. Unconsciousness, uh, that goes without saying, I think, that's sort of self-explanatory. So then we get on to the urgent care side of things, and you'll see some similarities, which we've already talked about a little bit here, cold, flu, um, ear infections, animal and insect bites, uh, seasonal allergies, bronchitis, sprains, minor fractures. When I talk about the differentiation in fractures, when it involves the arms or the legs, if there's a fracture of a long bone, the chances are greater that that might have to be seen in the emergency department. But if it's a smaller bone like a wrist bone, a finger bone, a hand bone, a foot bone, an ankle, oftentimes we can take care of those. But if they're major long bone injuries, then we worry about internal bleeding. And they uh, often will be sent to the ER. Vomiting and diarrhea, I think we covered urinary tract infections. We see a ton of urinary tract infections at urgent care. And as long as it's not a complicated case, then we can typically see those at urgent care. Um, we do have uh, x-rays and lab tests we'll talk about them in a little bit. We do see a lot of abdominal pain like I talked about before, and minor back pain issues without complicating features. Uh, we prefer not to see people who have a lot of chronic pain. If their chronic pain is, is worse, we prefer them to talk with their uh, specialist that they see or their family doctor, but nonetheless, we see all comers, so we'll do our best to help out if the need arises. So let's talk about the emergency room here just a little bit, and we'll kind of swing into urgent care. A few fun facts to look at from 2012, and this corresponds still with uh, this year in CDC data. 136 million visits to one of the country's 5,000 ERs. And over the past decade, hospitals have closed, ERs have closed, so those numbers continue to rise. You can just about imagine. 20 million arrived by ambulance. 43%, nearly half of all hospital admissions come through the emergency department. So that, I always refer to the emergency department as the front door to the hospital. It really is, because 
people are sent to the emergency department to have their initial workup done before they're sent up to the floor, before they're sent to the operating room or wherever they need to go, because we're experts there in expediting, getting those studies done, uh, stabilizing the patient, doing what we need to do. Um, but as you can imagine then, if the ERs are filling up with really sick people who need a, a, a detailed workup, uh, and, and, and the person in the room next to you maybe is having a heart attack or a stroke or they're getting ready to go to the operating room because of some injury, and you're there maybe for a sore throat, you can imagine that time is going to be taken away from you and it's going to be spent more on that individual who's sicker. So again, the point here is that because so many admissions come through the ER, they're busy, they're doing a lot of tests, and their triage applies more so than what we do at Urgent Care. We follow that same rule because we're a hospital-based urgent care, um, but uh, it's not a first-come, first-served basis in the ER. It's more of a first-come, first-served basis at Urgent Care, but we do employ certain strategies for triage if it's necessary. Okay, emergency rooms providing the unraveling safety net of care, and that's how ERs are proudly known. You talk to a lot of emergency physicians around the country, and they're proud of the fact that we see anybody, anytime, but regardless of their ability to pay, we see them all. And, and we're proud of that fact, and it needs to be that way for a lot of people. But it also comes with great expense and with burdens. So we're required to follow EMTALA guidelines. And EMTALA guidelines are federal laws that say you cannot turn away anybody at the door. Everybody that presents to your facility has to undergo what's called a medical screening exam. Uh, once, it's, once that exam is complete, it's determined how much care you need and where you go for your care. A lot of urgent care centers aren't under these EMTALA guidelines. We are because we're a hospital-based urgent care. So that's a distinction as you think about where you're going to go for your urgent care needs is are they privately owned or profit-based or are they hospital-based where we will see all comers at urgent care regardless of their ability to pay. For me personally, that's kind of my mission, uh, and it follows the mission, uh, the reason why I went into emergency medicine, because we will see anybody that comes in the door. Okay, but you can imagine this puts tremendous strain on the ER staff as well as, as the facilities. Quickly becoming unaffordable health care. Obamacare is referred to as the Affordable Health Care Act. Uh, but it's come into question, especially in the coming year, uh, how affordable that will be. It's estimated that $18 billion could be saved annually if people with non-emergent conditions went to an urgent care location rather than show up at the ER for their simple minor needs. $18 billion, that's, that's a tremendous figure. So we've got a lot of work ahead of us to try to educate people with uh, discussions like we're having tonight. From 2012 data, these are the top three reasons why people went to the emergency department in their community. Sprains and strains, upper respiratory infections, in other words, colds, and superficial or minor cuts, all things that could have been taken care of easily at an urgent care center. And this uh, graph I put in here just for some distinctive uh, differences between the, the diagnosis. Say the diagnosis is simple allergy. $345 in the ER, these are national, these are not Holland Hospital members, versus $97 at an urgent care center. You look at some of these other, like sinus infections, sinusitis, $112 at a typical urgent care center versus $617 by the time it's all said and done. Tremendous differences. Look at this here. A urinary, uncomplicated urinary tract infection, $112 bucks versus $665. And these are real numbers. Here's another example of that in numerical version here. If you look at the savings, the difference in cost on the right-hand column there between these different diagnoses. Same treatment, same diagnosis, but what a difference in cost. Probably 15, 20 years ago, when I first started in the emergency department, people never asked the question, how much is this test going to cost me? Uh, you just never thought about it. Nowadays, sometimes we have to actually convince people to get a test done because they're so cost conscious. And that's a good thing. It's a healthy thing. And we should be able to answer to those questions fairly directly and why we're getting those tests. But we're, as you can imagine, we're being much more cautious about what tests we order because of cost savings. A visit to one of the ERs 
is one of many reasons Americans spent $3 trillion on health care in 2014. 75 million people complained of problems paying off their medical debt, and medical debt is the number one cause for personal bankruptcy in the United States. And you know, you hear stories, you see it on the news, you read about it in the paper and magazines about someone who went to the emergency department and what they thought was a simple diagnosis ended up being a significant cost venture for them and put them into bankruptcy. They got to take out credit card debt, maybe open up another credit card or a bank account. Um, it's very stressful. The illness or injury itself is stressful enough, but then to add the cost of that afterward. So the history of urgent care, well, it really started to become popular in the 1980s. And I think prime care started in the early 1980s, I'm, I'm not mistaken. And someone can correct me from the audience out there that people I work with. But, um, and it's become more and more popular, especially so as Obamacare came into existence and was implemented in 2012. We began to look at this issue and say, they're only going to pay so much for a visit. And the question is, how much are you going to get out of it, and where's the best place to go? So that's why we got busy with urgent care centers here in Holland and began to work on that, that issue. Um, we are a hospital-based urgent care, as we refer to, not a privately owned. Um, explosive growth in urgent care centers across the nation for convenience and cost savings, time saving especially. Um, here, we serve in a supportive role with our, our PCPs. PCP means your primary care physician, your family doctor, and ED means emergency department. So here, we are not out there to compete with our family doctors or the emergency department for patients. They just come. We see an average of about 85 people every day at our Riley location and about a third of that number in Zealand at our newer location. So these people will, will if you build it, they will come. Um, and, but we choose to take a supportive role, and what that allows us to do, different than other urgent care centers, is it allows us to coordinate care with your primary care physician. So we serve them in a supportive role. That's our goal. That's our mindset. We're not here to compete for their patients. And you all have had the experience, I'm sure, of calling the doctor with an unanticipated ailment that's bothering you, and they say, oh, I'm sorry, we can get you in uh, three months from now. You know, and where do you go? Well, then you have to choose. And I think almost by default, uh, many medical practices, especially family doctors, have come into the practice of saying, well, we can't see you today. Go to the emergency room. And I, I want to qualify that and say, no, 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 that's not necessarily the case. They need to, you need to decide where you're going to go for the reasons we've been discussing. Okay, so we are primarily staffed by family physicians, internal medicine physicians, and ER physicians. It's a real mix. And uh, in the emergency department, everybody has pretty much the same expertise, same level of training. They're board certified in emergency medicine. Uh, but when you get to urgent care, uh, it's lesser acuity of care. So we take a variety of well-qualified physicians. We screen them very carefully. And we work as a team to recruit the best doctors we can. And we, I'm proud to say we have a really good team, not only of physicians, but nurses and physician assistants and nurse practitioners. I'd stack them up to the ER folks side by side any day. So, um, Duplicating nearly all services offered in physicians' offices and the ER with two major exceptions. First one, well, a lot of privately owned urgent care centers don't always keep medical histories and refer them to the PCP office. Here we do. All of the information that we have is kept on a computer, and that computer feed goes into your family doctor's office. So anytime your family doctor needs to know, hey, what happened? Did they go? I see that they went to urgent care. What, what did they diagnose them with? That information is readily available, and we make referrals to our primary care physicians and all our specialists uh, quite easily, compared to, say, an urgent care that may not have a hospital-based um, database to it. So it can make a difference. If you're out of town, you're traveling, obviously you go to the most convenient place. Uh, and we do not have the sophisticated medical equipment like the ER does. Uh, a great example of that is uh, imaging studies. We have plain x-ray available at urgent care. Most urgent cares have plain x-ray uh, to x-ray your finger, your wrist, your arm, your chest, your whatever. But we don't have CAT scan, we don't have ultrasound, we don't have MRI. And that's by 
that's intentional. We don't want to have those services available because we want to keep the flow of patients moving efficiently through urgent care so that we can see everybody that comes in to see us. Uh, nearly, okay, yeah. Nearly all procedures are covered by insurance. Uh, I, I was talking with Margot, we were talking about this the other day. What percentage of uh, patients that come to urgent care in Holland have insurance? It's about, what we say, about 90%, roughly. Pretty, pretty good uh, uh, number there. The average cost is about $150 per patient. That's a nationwide figure. That's not necessarily Holland's. I think Holland's is a little bit higher than that, but still comparatively speaking, compared to the hospital, it's a lot cheaper. Then there are retail clinics. You hear about retail clinics popping up in places like uh, pharmacies and Walgreens will give immunizations. Uh, some Walgreens or Meyer centers throughout West Michigan are, have what they call retail clinics where they have a nurse practitioner or a physician assistant staffing that. That's lesser cost than urgent care, but it's lesser technology. It's, you don't have on-site physician uh, people on, on uh, the property. And I think that's very important when it comes to urgent care. Um, sometimes nurse practitioners and physician assistants, as good as they are, will need to have the consultation available from a physician. Hey, I'm not sure what's going on here. I'm not, what do you think about this rash? And they, they have someone they, they can call on a cell phone or maybe use telemedicine to display a rash. And I, I think that the quality of care comes from urgent cares where you've got an on-site physician who's overseeing uh, all the patient care there. So a map of our two locations in, on Riley Street and the one in Zealand is over by the Ford Freeway. And that's, uh, we have, if you pull up hollandhospital.org on your computer, you'll not only get the links to these maps, but also the time you can expect to, to wait until you're seen. We have a clock ticking all the time, the hours that we're open. Keeping in mind that we're not a 24-7 operation. We have scheduled hours at different locations. In Holland, we're open from 10 a.m. to 10 p.m. And in Zealand, we're open at 7 a.m. till 7 p.m. Okay, so value in the community, coordinated care, on-call specialists. We use the same backup list as the emergency department. And the ones we use most often are orthopedics, ophthalmology. We see a lot of musculoskeletal injuries. Uh, we see a lot of eye issues. Uh, we're EMTALA guided care. Once again, that's a federal law that says because we're hospital based, we see all comers. We have a very easy referral process, and that's done through the computer so that when you leave urgent care, you have your diagnosis, an explanation of your diagnosis. Your prescriptions are automatically sent in most cases, unless it's a controlled substance to your pharmacy, and you have backup referral information on who to call and when to do that. And we are well linked with local and regional partners, especially Spectrum and Grand Rapids. Okay, so we mentioned this, we'll kind of breeze through this, some of the stuff we've already gone through. Laboratory testing, we have limited laboratory testing, what we call point of care testing and some blood testing available at urgent care. So for strep throat or for mono um, or for urinary tract infection uh, or for some basic values like a blood sugar or your kidney functions, things that we use day in and day out, we have that kind of testing, but it's probably about a third or a quarter of the testing that's available in the emergency department where they have more expanded testing available. And oftentimes, if, if we see you at urgent care and determine, ah, yeah, I think this really needs to be in the emergency department, we're really trying to focus on saving costs and saying, well, let's not do any of the tests here. Let's get it all done in one place, and we'll get you down in the emergency room and get it all done. That avoids duplication of care and duplication of costs. Uh, we read our own x-rays at urgent care, but they're always dual read by the, uh, the radiologist that's on call. So if we have any questions or if they have any concerns or if we see any discrepancies, we've got two physicians always looking at uh, the x-rays. We have a patient care manager available. And uh, boy, how do I describe a patient care manager? Uh, they're, they're God's gift to green earth, um, in my opinion. And social workers fit into that category too. Um, Patient care managers are experienced, skilled nurses who are based here at the hospital. Uh, and so if we see someone at urgent care or for that matter in the emergency department and that patient is discharged home, those needs don't necessarily end from the moment you walk out the door and we recognize that. Uh, we recognize that some people need a home assessment, just a follow-up checkup, someone to sort of guide the management of their medications and, and just determine what further needs 
does that patient have to keep them healthy and hopefully keep them out of the hospital? Well, we can call upon our patient care manager to help in a supportive role with that. And that's one thing that a hospital-based urgent care has an advantage in compared to a privately owned uh, urgent care center. Everything is electronic. Uh, almost nothing's on paper these days except for your discharge instructions. Uh, we record everything, triage, vital signs, our dictations, all our lab values, the computer, everything is on computer. Uh, so it's an enhanced electronic medical record keeping system. It's fairly efficient. We have what's called e-scribing, where in the majority of cases we can e-scribe automatically your prescription out to that pharmacy of your choice, and hopefully by the time you get there, it's nearly ready to pick up. Unless it's a controlled substance or a special type of medication that requires you to deliver a hand paper, a hand copy to the pharmacist. And all, like I said before, all this is coordinated with your primary care doctor's office. A little map is looking at the two urgent care locations in blue compared to the hospital and the emergency department there. Uh, the distance between our Riley location and our Zealand location, I think is about, if I measured it correctly, it's about six miles. It takes about seven minutes to drive. And uh, one thing we advertise is you know, a lot of times people will show up at our busiest location and they may have to sit there in cold and flu season or if we're having a really busy day. Uh, and we often try to promote, hey, you know, we've got another place five miles down the road. So oftentimes we'll kind of refer people that way. We have to be very careful how we do that. We're, we're subjected to rules and regulations, but feel free to ask. <laughs> All right, what happens if you end up at urgent care and we determine that you have to go to the emergency department? Um, we have a transfer policy, and people get to the emergency department in one of two ways, private vehicle if they're stable enough, or by ambulance if we're concerned or if they're unstable. Uh, and we, we transfer people primarily out to uh, the Spectrum system or mainly Holland Hospital. It depends on what the, the situation is. Um, and we have mechanisms in place to call the ambulance and get all that support in place. Their response times are excellent in this area. It's an AMR. Uh, and it's not only a question of where you want to go if you need to go to the hospital. It's also a question of where is the most appropriate hospital to send you to. So, for instance... Holland Hospital is a certified stroke center, and it's a certified cardiology center. So we could send you with your acute heart attack or your acute stroke here, but other hospitals nearby, a smaller community hospitals, may not necessarily have that certification. So although you're free to uh, ask where you want to go, we, we follow certain guidelines, and we want to send you to the most appropriate place to get that care, because a lot of that care is time-dependent. Any questions about that? Okay, so we formed a visionary team at uh, Holland Hospital's Urgent Care, and this began about uh, two and a half years ago. And uh, we brought together these ideas uh, to try to figure out how do we do our, our job a little bit better and more cost-effectively. And that led to the establishment of two new locations, which we've uh, shown on the slide. We have an excellent relationship with the Holland Hospital Physician Health Organization. Well, why is that important? Well, because what we can do is we've formed relationships with the PHO that will have allowed us to take our ideas and circulate those ideas among all the members in the medical community. So, for instance, if we have an idea, we think everybody should be following the same standard, uh, we brainstorm about that and we present it to the PHO and we've discovered that they're a great sounding board for us. They circulate it among all their members, which are most of the physicians in Holland Hospital. And then we create a sort of a a sounding board for about a month or two to run ideas past one another, uh, figure out the pros, the cons, edit, modify the plan, and then subject it to finalization and approval by the PHO. We've done this in a number of instances and really have led the way in creating standardized care for a lot of common conditions that are seen in the doctor's office, in the emergency department, and at urgent care. So our team has created that, and we're pretty proud of that. This is, these are this year's goal, streamlining the standard of care, again, taking a specific diagnosis, a specific problem, and trying to ensure that the care is consistent no matter who you see, whether it's a, a physician assistant, a nurse practitioner, a physician, uh, different shifts. We're trying to create a more, we don't want a cookbook method. Medicine is not a cookbook uh, issue, but we want to streamline the care to keep costs down and be efficient. Transparency of costs. 
A lot of people come in asking the question, how much will it cost me to get this EKG? How much will it cost to get this x-ray? And, and the quick answer is we can't specifically give you a price yet. We're working on that issue. The hospital's working very diligently because we understand we're in a consumer-driven healthcare economy and people want to know where their money's going to be spent. But we are becoming more transparent about that in terms of educating whether they actually need the test. Sometimes I'll, I'll talk about getting a test and the patient will ask, hey, doc, do I really need that test? And I've had a few instances where I go, I don't know, maybe not. We can wait. You know, we'll bargain with the patient as long as we feel comfortable with it. But if we feel that the test is really essential, we'll explain why that's necessary. Ultimately, you're the patient, you're the customer, you decide. Uh, telemedicine in the future. Um, you hear advertised a lot of, uh, uh, I think Spectrum and a few other places have advertised telemedicine in an urgent care setting. And I think they've sort of uh, rein that back a little bit. I, I'm not on board in terms of using telemedicine as a replacement for a hands-on physical exam. For certain things, it is appropriate. For certain rural locations, say you're 200 miles from the nearest medical facility, telemedicine is of great value in, in circumstances like that. But we're not in that situation here in West Michigan. We've got this huge medical mile 25 miles down the road, and we've got hospitals galore. And uh, so telemedicine is, is often advertised as being a cheaper alternative to urgent care, but there's no opportunity to assess their vital signs, do a hands-on examination, and that makes a world of difference when it comes to certain uh, diagnoses. So I think telemedicine definitely has a role, but that's, <clears throat> excuse me, that's going to continue to evolve over time, and we're, we're trying to figure that out ourselves. I think there will be ways we can use it. Yeah. Tell, yeah, basically over the phone or over the computer. So, you know, it would be like uh, uh, you coming into a center and, and you and I are in a different location, but we're connected via the Internet. And we're asking questions back and forth. Tell me about your symptoms. To a certain extent, we can look at, you know, certain body parts, but there's, there's no vital sign assessment. We can't check your blood pressure, your pulse, your temperature. Uh, we can't really specify that rash very easily by a vague picture. So there are a lot of disadvantages. I think we're, we're still trying to figure out just how telemedicine fits into the broader picture of medicine. And I think that eventually we will be using telemedicine to some extent, but it's not going to replace the hands-on physical exam that you get from seeing a qualified clinician. And of course, staying competitive. Okay, so these are some of the examples of where urgent care at Holland Hospital has really led the way for the community, all the doctor's offices, uh, some of the specialist offices, and the emergency department. Uh, we identified the Ottawa ankle rules, and basically what I've got here is a list of uh, projects that we worked on and, and what it translated to in parentheses. So the Ottawa ankle rules are a classic example. This was our first project. It's been well known for a number of years now that there's a certain set of clinical decision rules. When people come in with ankle injuries, everybody wants to know, is it a sprain or is it a fracture? Well, there are certain things that we do in the exam of looking at the ankle, and if they meet certain criteria, then they may not necessarily need to go through an x-ray. That saves a lot of cost. About 90% of all the x-rays of the ankle that are obtained either in the ER or at urgent care, they're normal. Normal in the sense that there's no broken bone or dislocated joint, and it ends up being a diagnosis of a badly sprained or minor sprained ankle. Well, we've figured out uh, ways to implement this in Holland such that we made placards across the board for all the offices, and this is supported by Shoreline Orthopedics as well, uh, who is the main orthopedic group that we work with at Holland Hospital. So that was the first thing we did. And I, I did a rough calculation one day when we started this project. I figured, well, let's just say it costs maybe 200 bucks to get a, a set of ankle x-rays. And we probably get maybe five to eight of those cases a day. Multiply that over time, how much cost savings you might have if you only do, say, half conservatively, half of those x-rays. You're saving the patient unnecessary radiation. They get through the system quicker. We're still going to splint it. Even if you don't have a broken bone, we're still going to support it. We're going to splint it. And so you're, we're not going to do any harm. And then they follow up about a week later and if determined that they're not doing much better, then it's probably appropriate to get an x-ray at that point. Um, if people insist on getting an x-ray, we never say no. We'll get it. You know, but we want to educate them at the same time. This is how you want to spend your health care dollars. 
Low back pain is another example of that. Sore throat for children ages 2 to 18. And with acute bronchitis, reducing antibiotics. There is a worldwide effort right now to cut back on the over-prescription of uh, unnecessary antibiotics, and we fall into that same philosophy here at Holland. Um, there are 90% 90, 90 of all the respiratory infections that we encounter, earaches, sore throats, coughs, chest congestion, sinus pressure, you name it, 90% of the time that's going to end up being a viral illness that does not require antibiotics. Well, why is that important? Cost savings. If you prescribe unnecessary antibiotics, there's always a risk that someone might have an adverse reaction to that. Common reactions like vomiting or bad diarrhea or anaphylactic shock, which is pretty rare. Um, and then we worry more and more about antibiotic resistance out in the community, and that applies here. We are seeing antibiotic resistance in Michigan uh, as well as other places across the globe. So we're trying to spend more time evaluating patients, listening to them. 80% of the diagnosis comes from just listening carefully and asking the right questions, and then educating the patient about why antibiotics may or may not be indicated. And that's a tremendous cost savings there as well. Urgent care DVT. DVT stands for a blood clot in an arm or a leg, deep vein thrombosis. A lot of people will present to our location or to the emergency department and they're concerned, gosh, could this be a blood clot? Well, what we figured out is a protocol that we've revised that allows patients, if they come to us, typically we don't have ultrasound. That's the way that's examined. But we don't have ultrasound at urgent care. How can we still get that ultrasound done without the cost endured in the ER? And we figured out protocols to make that work. Not, all, not every day, not all hours of the day, but for the most part, Monday through Friday, typical workday hours, we can get those patients through the system and save a lot of costs. Concussion care. We, we work especially on prevention and safe return to activity. We're working actively with the uh, sports medicine uh, group here at Holland Hospital right now. We see a lot of concussions at urgent care as they do in the emergency department. Future visionary projects. These are projects that we're working on for 2017. We're developing protocols right now to create a more standardized care approach to that. So we're working on being more efficient. Insurance coverage. The average urgent care cost ranges between $50, that's more typical of a retail clinic, to about $250 at an urgent care location, compared to hundreds of more dollars at the ER. Depends on the patient's copay and level of treatment, so if you're concerned about that, you need to check your plan and see what it covers and what it doesn't cover. 70% of urgent care patients use health care insurance, and their only cost is a copay, and our average copay is somewhere around $30. Bucks. So that, now that, I should say that this is a base charge right here, 50 to $250. If you have tests that are performed, that's an added cost. If you get an EKG, if you get an x-ray, if you get a, a certain test. And the average door to discharge time is about 65 minutes or less. Our goal is to get you in and out of the system within 60 minutes. That's our goal. Certain exceptions, you know, we will we'll see patients who are somewhat dehydrated, need some IV fluids and need a little extra care. Uh, they may stay a little bit longer, but the average is around 65 minutes. Okay, compared to the ER where the median cost is 1200 bucks. Higher estimates, easily 5000 bucks for a visit. Um, door to discharge time, obviously you're going to wait longer typically in the emergency department because they're seeing sicker people that need more attention first. So around two hours. The goal in the ER is typically around two hours to get you in and out if, you, if you're eligible to be discharged. Many carriers, we're seeing this increasingly, many carriers are denying ER payment if they deem it to be unnecessary. And that leaves you with that high cost if you end up in the emergency room for the stub toe or sore throat that could have been seen in urgent care. Now, always, um, you know, urgent care is not open during the midnight hours, so a lot of times people can sort of justify going to the ER during the midnight hours. But I always argue that if you've got a sore throat or if you've got a fever or you've got something that's relatively minor, you can go to the pharmacy now 24 hours a day and pick up a medication to carry you through typically overnight until you can be seen at an urgent care center. So think about why you're going when you're going. So a lot of insurance carriers look at what's called the prudent layperson standard. In other words, say you, you, you go to the emergency department for a sprained ankle. And this is their definition that they use as sort of their barometer. This is not 
universally applied the same way to every case. There's obviously lots of exceptions, but that's their barometer. That's what they, should we pay this bill or shouldn't we pay this bill? And that's kind of how they look at it. So a lot of different factors involved, uh, increasing denials for ER care. Who pays that? Could mean more credit card debt. Uh, they do allow for discretion in borderline cases. And when you appeal a case, uh, they're roughly 50% successful. And those that are successful still have to go through the process of appeals, which can be a headache in itself. 87% of Americans are now insured. That's one good thing about Obamacare is more people are on health insurance. The bad news is Obamacare was federally funded for approximately five years from the time of its implementation. That takes us to about 2017. That's coming up real quick here in a month or two. And a lot of the funding from the federal government now goes away. And as you hear in the news, expected premiums are going to increase exponentially. In some cases, higher than 100% for their health care plan. A low side of estimates is around 25% increase in premiums. So those are huge increases to have the existing insurance that a lot of people have right now. And they don't know what they're going to do. They don't know how they're going to be able to afford the medicine for their family or their children. And so, but we're also in an election phase right now. And don't ask me about uh, what's going to happen with repealing Obamacare as our uh, uh, president elect claims to do. I have no idea what that's going to look like. Uh, all these ta charges we're talking about exclude ambulance service, but check your plan. It may or may not be covered. And here in West Michigan, uh, there's AmbuCare. AmbuCare is, I think, a very valuable service uh, for people who need ambulance transportation where you pay lump sum fee. It's kind of like an insurance program, and the, the cost is very nominal compared to if you don't have that care, you end up you know, being taken in an ambulance from one place to another with IVs and cardiac monitoring. It's a huge bill. Okay, the future. This is our goal and the end of my discussion. Questions? Comments? Feedback? All right, I'll stick around for a little while if anybody has any burning questions, but uh, that's my talk, and thanks for coming. <laughs>